Welcome to All About Adoption. My name is Christine Altweis, and I'm your host for today. With me are two really wonderful special guests, Abigail Sylvester, welcome, and Mala Sylvester, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Abby is the Director of Social Work uh, at a local adoption agency, Hawaii International Child, and an adoption advocate and former Child Protective Services worker. Yes. And Mala is an adoption advocate and adopted person. Yes. So you're our expert today. Yes. Thanks for having us. Oh, thanks for being here. Um, so our topic today is learning to trust. And it's something that um, we hear about a lot when talking to both the workers and the children, um, the idea of trust and how we as humans develop trust in relationships um, is really important because if we don't trust, then we can't relax. And if we can't relax, we can't be our best selves, our healthiest selves, right? If we're constantly mm -hmm. worrying about what's gonna happen next and who's gonna do what and are they gonna let me down and are they gonna be there for me, then we're distracted and unable to, you know, just sort of live a normal life. Um, so one of the things we wanna talk about today is trust. And I think um, with what I know about your life, uh, this would be a great topic. So why don't we start by hearing your story. Tell us a little bit about where you started out in life and how you moved to the point where you are now. All right. Got this. <laughs> um, so I came, well, I was originally from American Samoa. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a hip problem and I came here for uh, medical reasons. And you were how old when you came here? Five. Five. Yes. Okay. And I went to Shriners Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, apparently they said I had a hip problem due to falling off the bridge. Falling off a bridge? Yeah. Can't really confirm that though. <laughs> okay. You have no memory of falling off a bridge? I do. Okay. Um, I, it's, yeah. Okay. So you were young when you fell off a bridge and you fell far enough that you at age five or six developed a hip problem. Yes. So a pretty traumatic fall. Yes. Okay. And and traumatic enough that they would bring you from Samoa to Hawaii. Oh, okay. Yes. Shriners was the hospital in the area that could the only hospital in the area that could treat her for this. Yes. Okay. So you come here at age five and you do you remember that? I remember coming on a plane with my dad mm -hmm. and my grandpa. Okay and arriving at the hospital, mm -hmm. going into surgeries. Okay, surgeries plural. Yes. So it wasn't just a few days at the hospital? No, uh, we're looking at three to six months. Okay, three to six months in the hospital at age seven. Okay, what happened after that? I got released and I stayed with dad's sister, uh, paternal auntie mm -hmm. and her family. Who lived in Hawaii? Yes. Okay, and how long were you with them? Till 12 and a half. Okay, and during that time was life pretty normal? Honestly, no. Okay, all right. Life was not normal. Life was, I can assume, difficult, mm -hmm. traumatic. S stuff happened that maybe we don't need to talk about, but not the kind of stuff that we think of when we think of a normal, happy childhood. Yes. It's okay. hard to build trust in that house, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And these things happened between the age of 7 and 12 while you were staying with relatives here on Oahu, and that resulted in you coming into the system. Yes. And by the system, we mean Child Protective Services. Yes. Okay. So you're 12 years old, and now what happens? And I'm in foster care, going from home to home. Okay. Can you remember back to that age and tell us what some of the dominant feelings were that you were having as you moved from home to home? Um, my feelings were mainly confused. Um, I always wanted to run away and go back to my family. Why did you want to run away? Uh, I, I didn't really have the clear answers to where my case was going with this. So even at 12, you're still a child, 
but you're old enough to know that things didn't make sense. Yes. Did you feel like the adults who were responsible for your case were not providing you with clear answers, or maybe you were afraid to ask the questions? At the time, my uh, case was still going through trial um, as a prosecuting trial. Okay. You're prosecuting family members who yeah. had hurt you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and I just want to make clear that this is absolutely not an attempt to indict or accuse the local child care system. We're just trying to get clarity on what it feels like to be someone like you and, and how we as adults who are supposed to be helping you can learn from your case and be mm -hmm. better prospective parents, better foster mm -hmm. parents, better case workers. So here you are 12 and you had how many homes before you landed in your final home? 32. You had 32 homes? Total, yes. Wow, okay. So you go to a new home, what do they tell you about your home that you're going to each time? What sorts of details do they give you? Um, I can't remember that. Okay. Um, they didn't, maybe not have given you a whole lot of details, just that you're going to a new home. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And the homes would be um, licensed foster care homes? Yes, and intensive home. Okay. Intensive in home uh, therapeutic homes through the Department of Health. Okay. I want to hear more about why you ended up in intensive homes, but let's go back to why did you move out of the very first home, the second home, the third home? What caused the change each time? Do you remember? Um, it was mostly me giving up on the foster parents. Um, it was like, kind of like uh, when I get attached to them and when they're ready to take um, guardianship of me or adoption. I tend to close them all on there and don't really want to accept it. So the foster family would be at a point where they would say to the caseworker, we love Mala, we want to consider moving to permanency, we want to adopt her, and then you would feel something that would cause you to do what? To run away and lose it. Run away and lose it. And you said something earlier that you burned through the house. That means you would just be like done. Mm -hmm. emotionally. Can you share what kind of behaviors you might have acted out in, your, in the houses that you lived in? I think that'd be really helpful for people listening. Mm -hmm. um, I would go into suicidal um, mode and... Okay. You would feel that desperate? Mm -hmm. Okay. What could the families have done at that point, if anything, to help you? Um, I can't answer that. Is it possible if there is nothing they could have done? At that point, yes. Do you feel like you had to go through a certain number of homes? It was a maturing process? Or do you feel like there was something that someone could have done to help you understand emotionally what was happening to you? Um, I think it was more maturity stage mm -hmm. um, and coming to a consensus that there are people out there that you know wants to love a kid it's just a matter of a kid taking it do you think it would have helped and maybe they did this but would it have helped if your foster parents had said you know there's not anything you could do that's going to cause you to lose this placement in our home did you ever hear that I did not hear that from any of the foster parents but well, I think it would have made it easier for me. Do you think you would have believed them? If they're really sincere, yes. I guess that's part of what we always want to remember is that adults often forget what it was like to be a child to the extent that we start to believe our own BS, right? So we <laughs> often believe, I don't know if I can say that on air, I'm sorry, I just said it, our own junk. We believe our own junk. and. Um, we often think that if we say the words to a kid, the kid's gonna believe the words. But kids can tell when adults are lying, right? And what kids are looking for, and I think in your case, it's, it's probably really apparent, 
kids are looking for action not words. Mm -hmm. If you show me that you're there for me no matter what I do, then I'll believe you. Mm -hmm. But if you just say it, my heart doesn't feel that, right? Yes. So you were looking for someone to really prove to you through their actions that you could trust them no matter what and that they weren't going to let you down like the other adults. Is that? Yeah. Okay. So 32 homes is a lot of homes. So that means some of those homes were just for a few months or weeks even? Possibly a couple yeah. days okay. here and there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Another thing that we hear often in, in cases like yours is that the kids have to test, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's part of your DNA at that point. You've been let down by so many adults when you get to that mm. point that you're just conditioned to constantly test the boundaries. Like mm -hmm. that's your reality, yeah. right? So you almost, even if you knew, I wanna be a good kid, I wanna not run away, I wanna not threaten suicide, but something in you just couldn't stop. Would you say that's accurate? Definitely. Okay. Not very proud of it, but I think that was my way of, you know, trying to see if the foster parents were really, really there for me. Mm -hmm. Like, whether they would give me up as soon as I get admitted into Queens or Kahi, mm -hmm. or whether they would take me back mm -hmm. and not be placed somewhere else. So everything you did that you say you're not proud of, and I want you to know that I think you have nothing to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. I really feel that in these situations, children are just reacting to what the adults are doing mm -hmm. around them or not doing. Children are innocent. Children are victims of mm -hmm. adult inaction or wrong action. And when she had come to foster care, you had no reason to trust that adults were there to take care of you and to support you and love you unconditionally because you hadn't experienced that for the past five years, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think it's important to forgive yourself and, and, and be proud of who you are because you've survived and here you mm -hmm. are, right? Came out the other side, mm -hmm. bright and shiny, <laughs> you know? So what we hear a lot is that that trust that we're talking about is so important. It's such a simple word, but as you're saying now, you couldn't trust these people. Right? You would do something to try and get their attention maybe, to try and give them an opportunity to prove that they were trustworthy, and they would let you down. So then you were just validated each time. So you were admitted to Kahi, you were yes. admitted to Queens, always for suicidal yes. attempts. Okay. What did it feel like to be in the hospital in those situations? How did you maintain the ability to keep going? Um, well, just pretty much being around like staff. Like for some reason, like I felt like I trusted the staff more. Like even though they like come on their shift and you know and go home. Mm. Like I don't know what it was, but I think it was like some kind of bonding or trust issue. Like that, I felt like I think it was also due to like confidential. Like, I don't know. That's so great to hear because we often say it only takes one adult to make a difference mm -hmm. in a kid's life, right? And along the way, there were adults who kept mm -hmm. you going, paid professionals, not the foster families, it sounds like, who mm -hmm. had integrity of action. And when they interacted with you, you really felt their true intent. That's encouraging. I like to hear and that. And some of those professionals are still a big support in your life now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She, her uh, DOH care coordinator, still involved, old therapist, still involved, checking on her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the interest of time, even though I would love to just talk all day about each one of those instances and learn from it, um, I want to move through to the happy end. Um, so... 32 homes between the age of 12 and 17. 17. Yes. And all the while in and out of treatment centers. Mm -hmm. um, 
never really connecting with a foster family. Mm -hmm. Were you going to school this whole time? Yes. And how was it to be in school and trying to focus on your studies while all this was going on around you? How many school switches did you have? Roughly 15. <laughs> they try to keep me in the same school even though I move a lot of homes. Okay. Um, they try to make it where the district would agree. Right. It depends on how well I did in that school. So what was it like to be a student while all this is happening in your personal life? Honestly, I felt like school was like my way of getting away from everything. Like, I kind of, I did have where I was short credits to graduate on time, mm -hmm. but like school was like my main thing where I like took my mind off of like everything mm -hmm. I was going through. Mm -hmm. Would it have been easier if you had been able to stay in the same school? Maybe. Hard to know, I guess, <laughs> right? I mean, we're guessing, but. But I think it's important. They say that every time a kid in foster care switches schools, yeah. they get behind an average like five months. So you look at all of that. I mean, it did take you, you had to really push it the very end to graduate on, on time um, to catch up on your credits. You had to do summer school. Mm -hmm. yeah. You had to have outside tutoring and help. So. It did add challenges. And I think you're pretty remarkable. What I was expecting you to say is that you couldn't focus in school and school was really hard because you had all this stuff going on around you. So I think you're probably an exceptional example. You're probably not a typical example. My guess is that most kids who have 32 homes in five years are going to really suffer in their academic career. But you have a, an exceptional... I went to all her IEP. She had, <laughs> it was a lot to catch up. I mean, she had to work really hard mm. to to stay caught up. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I did get like kicked out of school for like certain things mm -hmm. and I got sent into an, like a C-based program, okay. which wasn't very really happy about it, but okay. that was my only option into it and finishing school was okay. going into a C-base. Okay. So there was, there was some fallout. Yeah. School did suffer mm, yeah. a little bit. Okay, mm -hmm. your academic career was challenged by what was going on around you. Yeah. And I guess that's what we want you know, school people to know. We want teachers and school counselors to know that if they have a kid who's struggling, and they probably are informed that you're a kid who's going in and out of foster care. I mean, they probably know that. But we also want them to be really sensitive to the fact that being in school when your life mm -hmm. is falling apart is going to be so hard. Mm -hmm. And to, to give these kids an extra... Support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're 17. You have this amazing caseworker. <laughs> Were you dying to have her as your caseworker, this woman sitting on your left? Well, honestly, uh, she was actually a, a surprise one for me. Okay. <laughs> when I, so when we were on case rotation as social workers, and it was my turn to get a case. And on the transfer summary, which is a little thing that tells you at the case before mm -hmm. you get it, it said, she does not want a white worker on there. <laughs> what? Uh -huh. and yeah, it did. It did say that. Uh -huh. And um, my supervisor actually took me aside and said, you don't have to have this one because you were known to be a challenge. Um, and they were, there had been a lot of placement, um, a lot of needs, and I, felt like it was important for me to take it because it was my rotation and um, I felt like it was meant to be. Yeah. Okay, so at 17 you met, you have no recollection of saying you didn't want to white I think you were workers. 16 at this point, yeah, 16? I think it was 16, 16 yeah. yeah, 16 at this point. You know, and this is a big part of what we talk about a lot in adoption is, you know, cultural matching and trying to put kids in homes or with workers who can relate to them. Um, you know, putting kids in homes where ideally there's some similarity uh, or some shared culture, which is mm -hmm. obviously not the case with you and your mom. No. Former caseworker mom. Right. Right. Um, okay. So A lot maybe of things we'll that don't typically to, happen, yes. Right. Hopefully we can get back to that. Um, so you meet your, you don't know it at the time, future mother, <laughs> who's your caseworker. And what happened in those intervening years then? You're 16. Now you're? 24. 24, okay. What happened? You met, age 16. She's helping you figure things out. Oh, it was a rough road, honestly. 
tell us about that? Why was it a rough road? Uh, there were some rough choices that I made mm -hmm. um, that led me to being on probation. At this and point, she'd gotten pretty good of how, how can you blow through homes, and mm -hmm. she had learned the ways to do it within a couple of days, couple of weeks, rather mm -hmm. than months. Right. Okay. And you meet a tough opponent here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't give up on you. Did you feel that? Honestly, yes. You felt that? Yes. Even though she was your caseworker? Okay. And what did she do that made you feel that she was not going to leave you alone? Um, the minute I don't want to like do anything with like their foster parent group home, I call her up and say I want to get out of here. She tells me no. She's pretty strict on it. Okay. And that probably pissed you off, but it also sent a message to you, which was what? You got to work through it. Mm -hmm. And did it make you feel that she cared? Or did it make you feel that she didn't care? Uh, well, at the minute that I was mad, it made me feel like she didn't care, but afterwards I realized what she was trying to do. Mm -hmm. okay. I think the fact that I was answering my phone, too, after work hours to talk to you a lot, too, hopefully showed I cared. Yeah, being there, just like simply being there, right? Being there for someone as often as, as it's often that simple, just who answers the phone and, okay. Um, we only have a few minutes left I can't believe the time is almost over already. So let's fast forward to the end. So you are the caseworker. This case would typically end at age? 18. OK. Mm -hmm. So she's 18. Um, yes, yeah, so she had had guardian relative, took guardianship of her when she was um, almost, yeah, almost 18, though, close to 18. Mm -hmm. And um, then. We, I kept in touch with Mala. We had lunch regularly, um, phone conversations regularly. And when she was 19, she was needing a place to live. It hadn't worked out where she was living. And um, at that point, I couldn't fathom seeing her go be homeless. And there wasn't, there's not really a lot of options for kids who age out of foster care. So we had a room available at our house and um, after long conversations with my husband and my family. We felt it was right uh, for her to come live in our house. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take over from this story here? Okay, and bring we keep us home, wrap it up. Okay. Um, so within a couple of months, Mala asked my husband and I if she could, if we would adopt her. She said she'd always wanted to have a mom mm -hmm. and have a dad mm -hmm. and have a, f a permanent family, someone that she knew because her last name would be the, d the same, was knew was going to be there no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and she felt that our home was unconditional in that way. Mm. So, you know, mm -hmm. we're, look, we're gonna, no. I thought I was gonna get we're through that crying. Today. <laughs> so, so she um, was how old at that point where she asked you to be her mom? 19, Okay. and then by the time we did all the adoption paperwork, I think you were 21, when they, or 22. 22. Or 22. So 22. I'm really bad with late. numbers, but 22, we did the late. adoption. Mm -hmm. It's never too late, you, you need a family, you need a place to come home to for the holidays someone who's going to love you even when you don't feel like loving yourself. Someone who will make you walk the line and go to college and things like that. Get your driver's license. Right. It's something we crave. Mm -hmm. And we're never too old, I guess, for that. Right. And I'm just so, I, I've known your story for a while, but just hearing it again, I'm so grateful that you had the strength to ask, right? I mean, I think that took a lot of courage and uh, because rejection has been a big part of your past. Right? And the fact that you evolved after all of these broken trust experiences to a point where you could mm -hmm. ask, um, you know, and you could be trusting is huge. What an amazing story. And mm -hmm. here you are now. Here we are now. Three years later, or many, many years yeah. later, three years after adoption, and you've been living at home all this time, you're going off to a training shortly where you'll be away from home for the first time. Okay. Home on the weekends though, place to come do laundry, <laughs> okay. place to come raid the refrigerator, things okay. like that. All right, so before we uh, wrap up, last thought. Every child needs a forever family. Couldn't have said it better. That's good, and hang tight with them. This has been All About Adoption, thanks to Olello and my guests 
Abby uh, Sylvester. Thanks for and having me. Her daughter Mala. Thank, Thank you. you very much.